Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Today's show is brought to you by Rattlesnake Ranch Pecans. Rattlesnake Ranch Pecans can help take the stress out of holiday shopping with products that are sure to delight the taste buds of anyone on your list. Like their best-selling gift tins of gourmet assorted candy pecan flavors, including chocolate toffee, honey toasted, and Cajun roasted. I highly recommend checking out the four-way candied pecan assortment. It comes with creamy white, honey roasted pecans, milk chocolate covered pecans, and southern praline pecans. Oh my gracious, it is so delicious. It makes the perfect gift for someone you love or let's be honest, for yourself. Go to rattlesnakeranchpecans.com and get 15% off your entire purchase with the code Happy Hour at checkout. Happy Thanksgiving to all of my American friends that are listening. I hope you're enjoying time with your family and friends. Thanksgiving is tomorrow. And if you're like me, you might be listening to the show while road tripping to see your family, or maybe you're in the kitchen all day preparing for the big gathering that's happening at your house. Wherever you are, I want you to know how grateful I am for you. Seriously, thank you so much for choosing to listen to The Happy Hour, for sharing it with your people and connecting with me over on Instagram, Facebook, and through our newsletter. I am so thankful for you every time I meet a listener. I met a listener just recently at church. A sweet girl named Abby came up and was like, Jamie, I love your show. I listen every single Wednesday morning, and I just want to give her a hug and say thank you so much. Something I'm also thankful for is my guest today is my friend Susie Davis. Now, Susie is an original happy hour guest because she was episode number 48 way back in the day. She is a woman who loves women so well. In her latest book, Dear Daughter, Love Letters to the Next Generation, Susie creates a bridge between the two groups of women, dear daughters and spiritual mamas. Each group has valuable insight for the other wherever they are in their God story. Every time I visit with Susie, I feel so loved, so seen, and so celebrated. I also usually cry at some point when we're together as well. We spend the majority of our time talking about the phases in life and transitions in life for women during today's show. If you are someone who often wishes you had a mentor, this conversation is for you. If you are someone who thinks you could never be a mentor, this conversation is for you. I pray you walk away from today's conversation with a renewed faith that the ministry God has called you to is right where you already are. All right, friends, did you listen to the holiday gift guide yet? If you haven't, I'm going to highly recommend you put pause on this episode. Go back to the show that we released on November 22nd, and it's all about amazing places that we think you should spend your money this holiday season. There's great gift ideas. There's special discounts just for you listeners. And I want to take a moment to share with you about one of the special gift ideas we shared on the holiday gift guide. Compassion International is an organization that is close to our hearts in the Ivy House. We sponsor Brian in Kenya. We sponsor Wansley in Haiti. And we even used to sponsor Kiara in Peru before she aged out of the program. Even during the taping of our holiday gift guide show, my oldest son, Caden, who I let him skip a half a day of school, he was working as our second camera guy. And he was like, mom, can we add another child to our family through sponsorship? I'm like, yes. The Children in This Survival Program is a new part of Compassion's work to advocate for children and provide them with all they need to be released from poverty. This is a staggering statement that I'm about to tell you. 2.5 million babies and toddlers born into poverty die each year, and more than 300,000 women die from pregnancy or childbirth complications. What we're seeing here is that this new program they have, the survival program, is a critical time in the life of these children and these mamas. So Compassion saw this problem and thought, we can help. We can create a new program that is specifically for this demographic of children and mamas. So I talked to Kate and I was like, yes, I love the idea of a family gift that we would make this happen. And I invite you to do the same thing this year. I invite you to create a family gift that you can celebrate together as a family, that you're going to sponsor a survival program mama and infant through Compassion International as a gift to your entire family. Or you could gift it to your grandkids or gift it to one of your kids' teachers. Or like my own family, we can choose to do it together as a family gift. Super easy, you guys. Text happy hour, all one word, happy hour to 833-93. That's 
833-933-9393. Text the word happy hour, no spaces, 833-93. Or visit compassion.com slash happy hour for more information on sponsorship. I can personally attest to the work that Compassion is doing. I've seen it with my own eyes. I personally met our sponsored child, Brian, in Kenya. I met his whole family. My son, Deacon, was with me. My son, Caden, and my husband, Aaron, we met Wansley in Haiti. And Aaron visited and met Kiara and her mother in Peru years ago. I have seen this program that they're doing with the survival program. I've sat with these mamas who are being supported. This is an incredible opportunity that we have as a happy hour community to bring the presence of God to others Oh, and I almost forgot to tell you one of the greatest things on top of you getting the joy from seeing how you can enter into someone else's life and help them. For every happy hour sponsorship, you're gonna receive an ornament gift exclusive to our sponsorships from Grace Laced, which is Ruth Jo Simon's company. You heard her on the happy hour gift guide with me. It's hand-painted, keepsake, it's the Emmanuel ornament. So it's a beautiful, tangible reminder of the gift that God gave us with Christ and how we can be that for others. Visit compassion.com slash happy hour or text happy hour, all one word, no spaces, to 833-93. All right, my friends, here is my conversation with the ever lovely, fabulous, smart, gracious, amazing Susie Davis. Susie, welcome back to the happy hour. <laughs> I am so glad to be here. You're a returning guest. That's right. Which we don't have many returning guests anymore, just so you know, because not that I've had every guest is amazing, but there are so many people I want to talk to. I know, right? That I'm like, I love you, but I can't. Yeah. Because all these things. And yeah. so I love that you're here. I love that I was invited back. Of course you are. Thank you so much. Okay, so so you were on the show July of 2015. Oh my gosh. Four and a half years ago. Crazy town. That's crazy. (laughs) Episode number 48, if you want to go back and listen to it. Now, let me just say this. I don't think I've thought about this moment until just now. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Do you remember I cried? Oh, yeah. When you, when I was going to say when you interviewed me, no, I was interviewing you and I cried. I I know. I think because you were talking about your kids. We had a counseling session on the show. Online. It was good. Which is funny. Four years ago. So I, we were talking about like my kids like dating or something. Am I right? Or getting I married? I don't know. I think I just asked you a few questions and then there was like a pause and you were crying. That's all I know. <laughs> it's been maybe a hard day. <laughs> I mean, now my kids are four and a half years older. There are a lot more things that I would be crying about. Now looking back, I'm like, what could I have been crying about? You know, they were so young, but no, yeah. you're just, you have a mother heart. We had a counseling session yeah, right there. It was good. There were several times early on. I try to control my emotions a little bit more now on the show. Did you know? You're more professional. I, I, I think I am more professional. Like there's been a handful of times that I've listened to a show back and sobbed, wow. but did not cry in the interview. And I'm just trying to say like, I think I come in here with a little bit more like professionalism. Sure. But when I was interviewing you <laughs> four and a half years ago, we were just talking. We were just talking and Jamie got the crying. I know. What if it happens again? Well, how about this? You don't ask me any questions, Susie. <laughs> like, if you don't talk to me, then we're going to be good. But you can't help it. You can't, it's in you. It's in you. It, I do like to ask a good question or two. So four and a half years since you were last on the show, mm-hmm. what's happened in your life in four and a half years? Wow. That's interesting that you asked. Um, we have, my husband and I, Will, have three kids and two of them got married in the last four years. So that was big. Is the other one married already? Or yes, still, our okay. oldest is married. So all your kids are married? All married, have a grandson, which will like stomp my hell on the I mean, my heart is just like crumbles when I see him. He's adorable. His name is Caleb. Where does Caleb live? Caleb lives in Denver so far away, but it's good because it's just a two hour flight. That's true. But I think that what's reflected in what I just told you is this huge transition in my life as a mother and just as a wife and a woman, it really, I would say it's probably one of the biggest transitions I've gone through. Really? Mm -hmm. Tell me why, because I think transitioning to motherhood is a lot for people. Okay. I think transitioning out of college is a lot. Transition into marriage. Yeah. So tell me where, I mean, even like transitioning out of your parents' house, you know, I can look back and be like, oh, that was hard. Yeah. But why, tell me why this feels so hard. Um, I, I think that, what I mean, here's the deal. You pray up your kids from from before they're born. We were praying for the person they would marry. We have three. Then you keep praying 
for them and for that person that they're going to marry. And then they find that person they're going to marry. And you're so excited because you love that person that they picked, that God brought them to. And then you have this huge party and celebrate a wedding and then they leave. And it's this, this, um, so you're standing there waving the sparklers, whatever. It didn't even hit me then. I think I was just, you know, too high on joy at that point, but they leave and there's this really deep sadness that comes in that I, I totally was not expecting at all. Had anyone mentioned this to you before? Oh, people talk about it. But you don't know till you. Yeah. And it's kind of like when people talk about motherhood and before you have your first child and you have no idea what that means to have freedom to go to the bathroom by yourself and then have a kid and you have nothing. nothing you have yeah. nothing. Mm-hmm. You feel totally worthless. Yeah. Um, but when they all left, it was probably, I don't know, like. Six months after our youngest got married, when Sarah got married, I just felt weird. I felt weird with God. I felt weird in my life. I didn't, there was no like flow in my life. Did Will experience this? He's uh, a little bit later. Okay. But uh, I started meeting with a spiritual director and it was like the best thing I ever did in my life because she explained how there are like three phases of a woman's life. The maiden phase, which would be like zero to 18. Um, That's the phase in your life when you're receiving information, nurture from people. And then you enter the motherhood phase. And that's the phase where you're like giving life. And then you enter. Which doesn't even have to be like biological motherhood. No, no, no. Like any kind of giving back. Right. As a mature woman, start looking around your world and giving. And that can last a long time, decades. Mm -hmm. And then you enter into what my uh, spiritual director called the crone phase, which I was like, I don't like that. <laughs> That's name, a bad, please. New yeah, name. no, we call it the wise woman phase now, um, or the mentor is what I call it, where you have a different outlook on life and you're able to, to give life in a different way, but it, it's very different than the motherhood yeah. phase. And I just think a lot of women don't understand or know about these phases in their life. And so if you don't understand what's going on, there's always good before there's in a transition before there's something beautiful, something has to die. And so for me, it was just, I was in that season of understanding, you know, my, my kids are gone and I'm still their mother, of course. Hello, but never in the same way ever. You are going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there is a great loss, but inside that there's this wise joy of understanding that, you know, it's this thing that you prayed for and it's been accomplished and there's just this release. And and it's because I want to be the kind of mother and mother-in-law that my kids want to be around. So I have to release them. I release them to build a family that is not mine, to build a family that's more important than their family of origin. And that can be a deep grief. As you're talking, since I've never walked through this, I have been, and you have as well, been the one leaving. Right. We're both married. So we have left Mm -hmm. our parents. And as you're talking and you're saying this, I'm thinking, man, looking back as the new bride, I wasn't concerned with my parents anymore. I got this new man, this new life. And so now I'm like, they must have been sad. I'm going to ask them. They must have been sad and grieving like this loss because I lived at home till I got married. Right. I mean, I went away for two years, but then I moved home. Yeah. And so I was a part of that nuclear family, really, until June 22nd. And sometimes I think even women beyond their marriage reach back to their family of origin, their mom and their dad for like wisdom and encouragement. But at some point, your husband becomes your first line of defense, the first person you go to. So I have a question for you with something you just said. You said I had to kind of release and let them build their own thing and do their family how they want to do it. Have you had to consciously be aware of that? Have there been moments that you want to be like, hey, I saw this. Why don't you do it this way? It worked for me. Have you had to bite your tongue a little bit? Yeah. I mean, is that, that common for you? Um, No. I mean, I think, you know, I'm grateful because I feel like we have our, our family has like we've all have the same flavor. Like they all still love church. They all still love God. They all still. It's a big blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Big blessing. But I think it would be really hard if, if, if those priorities weren't like paramount, Yeah. but even in little things like, um, you know, with my girls, cause I'm a little less guarded with them than I am my daughter-in-law. 
Um, but, you know, I can inadvertently say things and I see the trigger when they're like a little defensive because they're women making their own decisions about what kind of wife they're going to be and what their family's going to look like. One of my best friends said in regards to like grandchildren, especially, it was so funny. She's ahead of me. Her kids are a little bit older. Or her grandkids are. And she said, <laughs> um, I got to do that once. So you do you. You do you. I already did this. And, but it's kind of a little mantra of mine now. I already got to do that. Remember, Susie, you already got to do that. So you don't need to speak into what they should be doing. That's good. Even though there probably is a small party that's like, if I were to do it again, I would be a little bit wiser with it. I mean, it's like when people become parents in their 40s. I'm like, oh, you're not as you're not as stressed out as I was at 25 because you've lived a little bit of life, you know? Yeah. So there has to be this moment of you going, okay, I think I do see this, but I already got to do this. I already did it. Yeah. It's just you love those people so much. And then it, like a grandchild, like, oh gosh. What does Caleb call you? Uh, Zuzu. Zuzu. Like Z-U-Z-U. Mm-hmm. And what about Will? Oh, he's Bear. Bear. Z- like cartoon characters, bear. right? <laughs> You're going to have a hard time finding that on a mug. Let me just tell you, like, that's going to be a custom mug right there for uh, Mother's Day for Zuzu. Yeah. I love it so much. So you have a daughter-in-law. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, I would guess that a lot of my listeners are daughters-in-laws yeah. and not mothers-in-laws. Yeah. How has that relationship been for you? And that's an unknown as well. We don't, that's not a relationship that we know how to do until it's given to us. So how have you learned? How have you strived to be a good mother-in-law? What does that relationship look like? Because you just said, I'm a little bit more guarded with her. You could just be open more with your daughters. Well, I think I, I just, I, when I say guarded, Amy, my daughter-in-law and I are very close. We have deep, meaningful conversations about all things. She's very, you know, willing to hear my advice or whatever on life, childering, whatever. But I do think you're right. I think there's a different, obviously there's a difference. And I think based on the women I talk to and a lot of the women I mentor, that can be a really difficult relationship. And the reason, I think the primary reason it's a difficult relationship is because the mother has not grieved and let go. Really? So do you think that's the root of it is we're looking at going? I do. Yeah. I think she feels... Let go of her son? Mm-hmm. Maybe the authority, maybe the, the Anyth- insight. You know what? And here, because here, my son, his name is Will, Her his favorite is Amy. That's the way it's supposed to be. That family is, I always say with, when I talk to my girls, I'm like, you need to know, like, you can talk to me about stuff that's going on in your life, but I'm, with my youngest is a Regan. I'm team Regan. My middle is a Boone. I'm team Boone. And I'm team Davis, as in. Will and Amy, yeah. Yeah. So, but that's hard. Because as a mother, you still see and regard your child as your child. Yeah. So it's releasing. But um, yeah, it's a difficult relationship for a lot of people. And it makes me sad because I really feel like that it's on the mother-in-law to release her son, to let them make their decisions, to let them have their arguments, to let them figure it out. And there needs to be a really healthy boundary. And I think that... Many women, mothers who haven't grieved, who haven't accepted this new role as a mentor, as a wise woman, if they're still trying to mother, it can wreck the relationship with the daughter-in-law. For sure. I do see when you talk about with it being this mother-in-law, I think also there's this just coming from a daughter-in-law, not me in particular, but Mm -hmm. just as women who are also dealing with this kind of new woman in their life. I think one of the things that can be difficult for the new wife is understanding and seeing like the value of that woman, because there can be a lot of women who come into a new marriage, a new relationship and go, uh, this is mine. Now you can just go on and like do your own thing. And there's a lot of pride in that as well. And a lot of fear. And maybe it's both. Maybe the mother has not released and maybe this new daughter-in-law is feeling a little threatened by that. I don't know. I'm just guessing here. And so it would also be a tendency to make it difficult. Yeah, I think that's true too. And I, yeah, I'm not saying that it's all the mother in law. No, no, no. I don't no, I don't think that at all. But I do think and I think that and, and I think even if if you're listening and you hear me talking and you're a daughter in law, it's about understanding that your mother in law loves your husband so much, her son. And it's maybe that'll make you a little more tender when she's irritating. Yeah. Susie, one of the things that I really 
love and admire about you is the way that you see pouring into women around you. And you have lived that out in every season of your life. Ever since I've known you, I see you with even talking about when you talk about your daughters and your daughter-in-law's daughter-in-law that you're still continuing to pour into them. And it just looks different. It just looks different. But this has been really important for you as to pouring in to women throughout your life. Where did this come from? Is this something you've always kind of had in you or did this come out which is the way ministry is taking you. Where does, where does this come from? No, I mean, it's been completely organic. I would say that I consider myself, I call myself a spiritual mama um, because for me, this all started when my kids probably were in high school and they'd bring their friends over and I'd be making peanut butter sandwiches and slide them across the kitchen counter. Um, And so what happened is their friends, I would ask their friends questions and we would talk and have conversations, you know, and try to get, you know, ask them about God in their life or whatever. And then they would come back and we continue to have those conversations. And then when my girls went off to college, um, I had known a lot of their friends and encouraged them. Um, I started writing little online notes to my girls and I just had a big response. And then I had other women reaching out, but this whole idea of being a mentor, here's the deal. I think that we make way too big of a deal of it. You mean it sounds too like this too I grand it, thing that's that right. is unreachable? And that's why I don't even call it mentoring. It's people, older women are intimidated by it. Um, a lot of people think that you have to have a structured something. Like a, a, you have this like kind of checklist that you go through. You meet, mm-hmm. you have a Bible study. Mm-hmm. Um, you have prescribed times that you call. That's And that's like, the exact opposite of what it's been for me. Yeah. It's just being available and having a mother heart and, and being the grown up Mm -hmm. and being willing to, um, you know, encourage the people around you through your life experience. And you know what? I want to say this too. It's not even really about like thinking you need to help someone by telling them what to do or whatever in their life. It's about asking questions. You're a good question asker. It's about asking questions and listening and and listening for God and and hopefully helping them see where God is in their yeah. life and letting them uncover what's going on. We had a friend on the show, Kat Armstrong, and she recently shared a story about when she first started following Jesus. She said there was this older girl, just a handful of years older than me, who she would look back and say, she used the words disciple her, mentor. And she said, I mean, that's been 15 years ago, more than that, probably. She said she recently saw her and was like, hey, thank you. And what program were you using? And the girl was like, program? <laughs> like We just met and hung out. And I just, I just, I, she, she said this word. She said, I just talked to you about what my pastor talked about on Sundays. Like, we just talked about things. And I remember thinking, that's so good because we can think this has to be, well, for me to be a quote unquote mentor, we'll use the word because people understand it. For me to be that, then I need to be trained and I need to go through a class and I need a curriculum, which there's nothing wrong with those things. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Because there are plenty of great things out there. Right. But you're like, it's a lot simpler, ladies. Yeah, I just think it's it really is just about, you know, Ministry is where you are, you are. You don't have to go create a ministry. There are already people around you. And it's about having eyes and, and a heart for those people, whoever they are. For me, it was, you know, my kids' friends. And now it's other women who've reached out and then I've developed a relationship with through like a profession in a professional setting. One of my the girls I mentor that I've been mentoring for 10 years is someone who built my website way back when. And I met with her and she was so young and I asked her about her family and we started talking and there was a vibe there and I just wanted to encourage her. And so that's that's how it works. It doesn't have to be some big thing. I love. So what does it look like over 10 years, though? So it looks like what it looks like with my girls. OK, you know, I mean, for me, it's just being like I said, that's why I call it a spiritual mother, because I'm just in a way mothering her spiritually. She um you know, a lot of the girls that I have mentored over the years don't have, they m- might have good moms, but maybe good moms that weren't spiritual. Mm-hmm. But although I want my girls, I think of myself as a spiritual woman. I, I My girls come to me and talk to me, but I want them to have spiritual moments where they live. I don't want to be the only woman speaking into their life. That's good. That 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 also, some pe- some women would struggle with that. A feeling like I want to be the the main person, but we we think in the Ivy household, the more people that are speaking into oh. our kids that are saying the same thing, yes, please, one hundred percent. And I, you know, I'll say this, and this this will be very controversial for some people. Oh, good, I love it. Bring it, Susie. 
Su- I don't Zuzu. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I do not want to be. I don't want my girls to say my mom's my best friend. I don't. I don't because the best friend is like a it's it's like a peer relationship in my mind, and I get to be their mother forever. I just got goosebumps. Yeah, that's what I get to be, and so. I I ha- I know they'll have friends that they go do stuff with, but I think of what I get to do is much more sacred than just being a best friend. Mm. I want them to hang out with me. Me and my girls go to Round Top twice a year. We stay overnight. We have so much fun. I laugh with them like I laugh with no other people. But I still, even when I'm with them, I'm their mother. And I'm not going to talk to them about problems that I'm having with my husband and I'm not get, I'm never going to forget that I get to be the mother. And that is a whole different thing than being a best friend. That's really good, Susie. I think that there's this mentality of people who are in the mothering stage that I'm in with 15, 14, 13, 11 of thinking I'm their mother now and then we can be friends later. Like that's a kind of a common. I think you're right. Right. Um, but there is this idea of I will always be their mama. Like nothing can ever change that. Nothing. And so it's a really specific role. And I tell my kids um, all the time, especially because we have three that joined our family through adoption. So it's a much bigger conversation of, I'm so glad God chose me to be your mom. Right. Like I just, one of them, my birth, that's just how it happened. But the other three, I think, man, God could have picked anybody to be your second mom. They all right. have a first mom. We lo- we know that yeah. we talk about it. But I'm like, man, how thankful am I that I that God picked me to be that. And it is this, it's a good reminder that we get to be that forever. Okay, friends, I know you're loving my conversation with Susie, but I want to thank our sponsors for making today's show happen. Today's show is brought to you by Thread Up. If you're following me over on Instagram, you've seen firsthand some of my secondhand finds. You can get fabulous pieces at up to 90% off regular retail. Thrifting is fun, but spending hours sifting through the racks is not fun to me, especially when the holidays are busy enough and I've got other places I need to be. Well, Thread Up makes it easy to get thrift store pricing with the convenience of never leaving your house, my people. It's online shopping at its best. I do not have time to run from store to store looking for all the best price items while shopping for holiday gifts this season. That's why I love that Thread Up can be a one-stop shop for so many apparel needs. I love that I can save time and money with the convenience of their online shop. ThreadUp is the world's largest online thrift store, and it's on a mission to help you be kinder to your wallet and kinder to the planet this season. Shop today for an extra 30% off your first order. Go to threadup.com slash Jamie. Discover millions of secondhand finds from trendy brands like Everlane, Vince, and even Theory, all up to 90% off estimated retail. And here's what I love the most, you guys. Instead of spending hours going through all of the racks, you can shop millions of deals on your phone anywhere, anytime. Personalize your search by budget, size, styles, and favorite brands to find exactly what you're looking for. All the items are in high quality condition and some even still have tags on them. ThreadUp is a sustainable and more affordable way to get through the season. And for the happy hour listeners, here's a little extra holiday cheer. Get 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash Jamie. That's 30% off your first order at threadup, T-H-R-E-D-U-P.com slash Jamie, J-A-M-I-E. Today's show is sponsored by Flamingo. There's nothing better than that pre-holiday party getting ready super special time to yourself, especially when it's just too cold to go outside. That's why I love Flamingo. Flamingo makes body care for women with hair. A great razor, shave gel, body lotion, the works. They have it all. Hair removal can be a chore, but the Flamingo shave set is anything other than routine. And while it's a $22 value, for you, it is $16 with free shipping. The Flamingo Shave Set would make a great gift for your girlfriend, your daughter, your sister, aunt, mom, teacher, stocking stuffer. The product smells and feels luxurious. I used to hate the extra effort it was to shave my legs and remove unwanted body hair, but with Flamingo, that dread is gone. Each time I use the shave gel and razor, it feels like I'm being pampered. You'll love the closeness of the shave and how soft your skin feels after. Think about it. You probably spend more than $16 on razors and blades already. With the Flamingo Shave Set, you can upgrade for less than the same as you're paying right now. It comes with the Flamingo Razor, 
foaming shave gel, body lotion, shower hook, and a reusable travel pouch that I love you guys. Get your Flamingo shave set for just $16 with free shipping today when you visit shopflamingo.com slash happy hour. That's shopflamingo.com slash happy hour. Okay, guys, back to the rest of the show with my friend Susie Davis. What do you say to, because you just said, I want my daughters to have these kind of women, spiritual mothers pouring into them. That could maybe be a little hard for some women to feel as though my daughter doesn't confide in me. She confides in someone else. Or like, what's, what do you say to that woman who's listening and going, I wish my daughter would talk to me? Well, I'll give you an example. When Emily, our, our middle, moved off, she uh, moved to Navasota early in her marriage. She had lived here. They got married and then they moved. So when she was here, we talked about stuff. But when she moved away, she found another woman stepped into her life as a spiritual mother. And I was so grateful. And I know that Emily talked to her about her marriage. And I know that Emily didn't talk to me about her marriage. And there was a reason. Emily had a good boundary. Because she understood that if I talked to my mom about all the things going on, my mom is going to prefer me over my husband. Because it's your baby. Yeah. Yeah, you can't not. Yeah, I know. And so she understands that whole team Boone thing. Like, how am I going to help my mother be pro us? Yeah. Yeah. And so I know she didn't talk to me. We talked about the fact that she didn't talk to me about things. Um, And I was. And your feelings were not hurt. That's what I think. That's what you were talking about, that you had to learn. That's not my role right now. The wise woman realizes that the mother phase is over. And that this is this is her chance and her opportunity to step into a different role. And it's encouraging whatever encourages their marriage. And that includes excluding me. And that's like tough stuff. Mm-hmm. But if a woman doesn't understand that that's the next role, it can really screw up yeah. a kid's marriage. If I start picking apart my kid's spouse's that's as you don't want to go down that road. No, how are they? What am I? What are my kids supposed to do? Loyalty to me or this mm-hmm. person that they're supposed to be loyal to above all? Yeah, yeah. I think that when we talk about that uh, in law relationship, I think that can be super, super discouraging when that starts happening. Yeah. Because then, I mean, it's it's. A, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, I know. What's a person supposed to do? Yeah, I know. It's a house divided, and it will fall. A house divided always falls. Yeah. So you go what. What does God say about the marriage relationship and how do I honor that in them and let them be them and whatever that involves other people speaking in their lives and how do I be a grown up and lean into God and allow these things that I love to happen, you know, to people like allow this distance, this, you know, almost severing in some way. Like how do I and what does my life look like then? That's where that's where I was two years ago. What does my life look like then? Those are the kinds of things that you walk through through seasons of your life. After the sparklers are gone, it's you and Will. Yeah, and I got a big old house I'm banging around in, and our marriage is different, and it's funny and different in what way? Um, I don't know. Just I, I, it's so surprising because we were high school sweethearts, so I've known him a long time, and we'll have been married 35 years this summer. So. It's just funny. Like, I never knew we'd be in a house with a pool and every day he'd walk and like pencil drop into the pool. And I think that was so funny. I never, I just didn't know what what our life would look like when the kids were gone. And it's, we, y'all, we were the people who like sat down at the table at dinner, no TV, blah, you know, no phones. Will and I watch, you know, <laughs> we're, we're in our You're like, you want to eat dinner we, in front of the TV oh, tonight? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all we do. Like, rarely do we get to the table and we have, we watch Parenthood three times through, I'm talking about the entire oh series. Oh my gosh. Just, just did Friday Night Lights. That's like, a good one. I just didn't know that's who we would be. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you have a child that lives here in Austin still? Tripping Springs. Emily and Kenton moved back to okay. the area. So they're far enough that we're not dropping by, mm-hmm. which is a whole nother thing. Like, wow, you can talk about that. You know, respecting people and like be, being family doesn't mean that you don't respect boundaries. Have you have a, have you had a holiday yet where someone couldn't come? Oh, gosh, yeah. See, I think that's a big deal for people. Oh, my gosh. Christmas. Was it last year? Yeah. Last year, we were, it was just me and Will. Talk about weird. 
And But here's what I say. It's just another day. It really is. And it's just another day. And I look forward to the times, and I've told him this, that we are able to be together. And family is fragile. And so you have to be um, careful that you don't place expectations on each other that end up creating drama. I don't want to be that woman. I do not want to be the woman that my kids or my in-laws are talking about. I really, really don't. I want to be the one that encourages them, that lets them fly, that supports them. I want to be their biggest cheerleaders. I want to be their biggest prayers. I want to be, you know, I want to be, here's what I think about Jamie. I know this might sound morose, but I'm like, how will I be eulogized? Oh. And um, one of the reasons my name is Zuzu is I picked it. Caleb doesn't talk yet. And this was like a big conversation in our family, like two years before they even, right when Amy and Will got married, I started talking about my grandmother and they're like, oh, lady. (laughs) But I was like, look, the reason I want to pick a good name is because my kids will get up and they will call me that name when I die. They will say, Zuzu was this, Uh you know, blah. They they won't call me mom. Yeah. They'll call me by my grandmother name. It's true. It's what we do. It's exactly. I I talk to my about my mom or dad with my kids or I'm like Nana and Pops. That's yeah. so you you better pick a good name. <laughs> uh, so we, you know, went through all that and they helped pick that name. But anyway, um, how will I be eulogized? What will people get up and say about me? And the people who will be speaking are my kids. And what are they going to say about me? Well, I want to live my life in a way that I have, I've been, I'm eulogized in an in a manner that magnifies who God is in my life. Yeah. I also want to have white roses and happy hour after the funeral. I've already told them this. But you won't be there no, for them to have be, happy hour. I want them to cry and get it over with and see all the pictures. and be- I want lots of scents, like yummy scents going on and stuff like that. Favorite songs, not all worship songs at all, you know. I mm-hmm. mean, whatever I want, I want to get that in there. And then afterward, I want like beautiful patio reception with, you know, my favorite wine and, you know, whatever. I love this. We're not having the fellowship dinner after no. Zuzu. We're we're having a party. Should, a, we're going to celebrate you. Yeah, a big This feels party. weird to talk about. Can we move on? I don't no. want to talk about the Absolutely. party after you die. But you know what? I mean, why, this is a very real part of life. And we live our lives. If if that's the final, like, shebang, the hurrah, the, the sparkler part of your life is your funeral. I want to be eulogized in a way that honors God and is lively and fun and beautiful. And what does that look like? Kate Merrick said that the death rate in America is 100%. I love her and I, I love agree. Kate so much. <laughs> so when we're talking about mentorship and you pouring into your daughters and their friends, is that where this dear daughters concept came from? I'm assuming it's a yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Big yes. And it, did this come from, I remember when you said through, did you used to do this on Instagram? I did. Is this where this started? I, it started on Instagram primarily. I would do little dear daughters things. And that's when I realized, oh gosh, there's a lot of young women out there who want to be encouraged. I loved it. Do you still do it? I do. Not as much. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. But then where did the concept, you have a book that came out in April. It's called Dear Daughters, Love mm-hmm. Letters to the Next Generation. Right. Um, it's beautiful. It's a. Um, it's definitely, this is not a gift book, is it? I would call it a gift book. Yeah. It is a gift book. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you it know, looks in the like a gift book section, and it's kind the size of, yeah. of a gift book yeah, and stuff. It's small and pretty. Um, but it's beautiful. It's Thank a great you. thing. So, writing the book, tell me what you wrote this book for. Who you wrote I it for? I wrote this book for, uh, really, I think for young, younger women. I wanted to have a conversation. Actually, it's a lot of the conversations in the book are conversations I've had with women, young women. And I ask a lot of questions in the book. And then, so it's really like a first conversation. If you don't have a spiritual mentor, a spiritual mom, I just wanted to walk through your life through that book. But it also is really meant to be a bridge building book. Between, I want an older woman and a younger woman to sit down. If you're an older woman and you don't know what to ask or say, you read the book, you have a conversation ready or, or vice versa. And so I want, I want real time people sitting in their communities one-on-one having these conversations. And um, I just, I hear from a lot of women, a lot of women reach out on, on, uh, you know, social media and say, will you mentor me? And mm. it breaks. Cause you can't say yes. 
I can't. You don't have the hours in the day. I mean, you know, it's not that you're mean. Right. You don't have the hours. And so I realized, gosh, we need an army of spiritual mamas to stand up and be available to these young women. And that's why I try to demystify mentoring. It's not a big deal. You don't need to be freaked out about it. You don't need a degree in theology or psychology. And I'll give you the questions, for heaven's sakes, to ask people. Um, but you need to, like, we need to stand up and be available. It's like, it's if someone, it's life-changing. And everybody can think of a co- maybe even one conversation they had with someone that changed their life. Yeah, we all can. And so I just want to encourage that. You have someone that you could be pouring into. And I want to tell you this. You deserve a mentor. I think every woman does. And I want every woman to have one. And so I want you to look around your community and I want you to think of that person you admire. And I want you to just don't walk up and freak them out and say, will you be my mentor? And hand them the book. That would be bad. Just ask them to coffee. And then just let them talk or talk about your life, you know? In the book, you cover a lot of things that women are dealing with today. Uh, Worry, life's purpose, loving Mm -hmm. your body, relationship with your father, expectations. I mean, the list goes on. And these are conversations that are great conversation starters between this mentor, spiritual mama, spiritual child kind of relationship. I think one of the questions that I just thought of that I think some women might be feeling is a lot of times we we use this word spiritual mama, which can make some women who God has not made them a mom, a physical mom. Oh. And then they could have this feeling of, am I qualified for this? Because I've never technically raised children. What does it look like to be a spiritual mama that who's not a physical mama? Well, that's so fun because I I do have, there's a woman in our church who struggled with this. Every Mother's Day, she would feel, you know, the whole, understandably, this little, yeah, like maybe disappointed. Like, yeah, God, I don't have she had this. been married, but got divorced and she never had kids. And I kept telling her, she, but meanwhile, she would go to Guatemala and encourage all these children, like mothered them, basically the same, like go back in the same kids every year she would see them. And I kept telling her, you are a spiritual mother. You don't have to have children to raise up children. And so um, she finally started regarding herself as a spiritual mom. And she would text me and tell me and update me. And it was beautiful, but you don't have to have kids that, you know, you don't have to have children, biological or adoptive, to be a spiritual mother. Which is so true in the phase of life that you're in right now, because you've mentioned several times, like my daughters are clinging, not clinging, but they're having these other women that are pouring in. So you're pouring into girls that aren't even related to you. Exactly. You're this empty nester, which is such a kind of crazy name, right? But empty nester that watches Parenthood three seasons in a row <laughs> <laughs> and takes swimming, dipping in the pool every morning. Um, but you have the opp- a unique opportunity in your stage of life to pour into women that would have been more difficult 10 years ago right. when you were in the midst of parenting. Absolutely. Different parenting, we'll say. Yeah. yeah. No, and it, and, and it is different parenting. Yeah. So... Susie, you're you're like a spiritual mama, but you're also over here like you're like a work mama to me right now because this book I hold in my hands, Dear Daughter, is released in April and you have another book coming out this spring. I do. What is happening with your life? I don't know. That was crazy town, but it's such a blessing and I'm so excited. It's really meant to be a companion book to Dear Daughters. It's called The Grace Guide and it's about living your one beautiful life. Like I just, this book was, Dear Daughters was really about loving your life. Like see your beautiful life, like love your life, enjoy it. And the grace God is really about living it because when we have grace in our lives, we're able to go out and really enjoy our lives. Mm. And that is a real passion of mine. I love it. I love it. Um, so we'll be looking for that. Yeah. Congratulations. And your podcast. Yeah. Do you love that? I do. <laughs> That's so What fun. do you love more, podcasting or writing or speaking? Oh, you know, I, I would say I like different things in different seasons. Okay. And we we talked even earlier about how writing is like you're underwater. And then when you when the book comes out, it's like you're at the beach above the water, having fun with the people. So I really like the creative kind of role of things, like the way that I get to do writing and then I get to enjoy, you know, being out with people more and having events or going to events and stuff like that. I well, like it all. Well, I love your podcast because um, you do. How often do you have it where you have people in the room with you? Well, we we do coffee and conversation, which is really fun when an author will come to the house and we'll have people come also. So 
So it just depends. It's it's like it just depends on what's going on. And they come on. to your house. They do. It's very fun. How do you who gets invited to this? Your friends? <laughs> <laughs> just depends. Like, I mean, we've had lots of different people. Pam Tebow was a real favorite. I bet. Um, but yeah, we've just had different people come in town and we have a coffee and conversation and people get to come in. I'm starting um Soul Care Weekend soon, which will be really fun. What is that? I want you to come to I one. need to come. I need some soul care. Yeah. A soul care weekend is I'm actually doing hosting it at the house, which is like a big favorite thing. And it'll be a really small group. It'll be like Friday and Saturday. And it's kind of walking through some of these things I've talked about, like just diving deep into where are you with God? What's going on? What phase of life are you in? Um, so I'm really Can excited I do about one, that. Just one on one, just you and I. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> Can we have a soul care weekend? Maybe we could do it in Round Top. <laughs> I would love, I would that. love that. that. would be so good. Ooh, I have just, We're gonna have wine and yes, drink uh-huh. and eat and talk antiques and, and talk, and yeah, then we'll eat at Warriors, actually, and we'll just yeah. have the time of our life. <laughs> this sounds amazing. Uh, tell your girls you cannot do Round Top with them next. That Jamie is coming. <laughs> okay, in Jamie's their spot. going. Jamie's coming. Yeah. That I love it. Um, you know, it's funny. People ask me often, I just did an interview today with someone and she's like, how did you get into podcasting? And my story know, is always just funny? crazy. I've, I was in radio for a split second and you were in radio for longer than a split second. But isn't it funny to look back and think, God, only you could have orchestrated things that have happened. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy town. I think I, that was so much fun. P.S. Radio? Yeah. It so much fun. And it was so fun because like Bobby Bones was down the, I mean, he was not. Who he, he is wasn't now. Bobby Bones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like he yeah. was down the down the hall from us. It was so fun. But yeah, I I think of it this way. When I look back over my life, Will says, my husband says, God's been real creative with me and playful with me because I've gotten to do a lot of different things. But it's kind of like he he'll, you know, there'll be a door and I'll just like kind of kick it open. And and these are all opportunities that he's given. Um, but it's been so much fun. How long were you at the radio? I think I was there like a year and a half okay. before it, yeah, changed the format changed. Yeah, and then you were then you were gone. Well, then I went to a different one. I got hired at the different one, a different one here in town. So and how long did you do radio? Gracious, I guess three years. Okay, yeah, yeah, I did it for four months. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Here we are. Here we are. Um, but speaking of Bobby Bones, he was down the hall and Amy was yes. here still in Austin when I was working there, and so, so she was so kind to me. Um, okay, so Thanksgiving's tomorrow. So all of us in America yeah, are going to be celebrating like Thanksgiving. Favorite day. Uh, we will actually be on the beach. Speaking of the beach. So we're taking our entire family. Wow. To Mexico. Oh my gosh. This will be the first time our entire family has flown on an airplane together. All six of us. It's expensive to fly. Yeah, it is. And so we're taking everybody. We're heading to Mexico. We're going to be there for a week. And it's just, it. it we're going to Air Night's favorite place to get away. So there's a part of us that's like, why are we bringing the children? Because we love this place so much. It's like our place. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, good things happen there. Like I wrote I wrote my first book there a lot of wow. it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's just a special place for us. But we're taking the kids. We're inviting them into our specialness. That's very yeah. nice. So we'll do Thanksgiving in Mexico. What are you guys doing? Well, we're gonna have a lot of pie. I can promise you that. Like I'm a pie girl. You I, make all the pies? I do make pies. Homemade crust? Oh gosh. Okay. See, That's I don't do like any. An I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know. I, I will say I'm a pie crust snob. I don't understand walking driving to the grocery store, walking all the way to the back, grabbing that thing that the is in a box cracker crust. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, it takes like, I actually have um, several pie recipes on my blog, but one of them is a roll out pie. Like you don't even, I mean, not roll, it's a no roll pie. You don't even have to like, you press it in, you pour all the ingredients in the tin, you press it out and you're a genius. That's it. You're it's on your genius. blog? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to, if you need a pie <laughs> recipe for tomorrow, we're yeah, going to hook you up. Mimi's pumpkin pie. I always make my mom's pumpkin pie. And uh, yeah, I'm up. I love pie. Pie is Texas, right? Yeah. Pie is home. Pie is good. Pie yeah. is comfort. Mm-hmm. Lots of pie. Okay, lots of pie. Mm-hmm. Are all your children going to be with you? No, we won't see them all. Okay. Um, and that's we'll, okay? That's okay. Because it's just a day. It's just a day. So, but we will see my family, my biggest extended families here in town, uh, Will Sisters. So we'll see a lot of people. We'll eat a lot of food. Yeah. Which, if you listen to Susie on episode 48 when you were first here, we say that you are an OG Austinite. Like that is not a thing <laughs> anymore true. in Austin, but you were raised here in Austin, Texas. Born here. Born here and well too, right? Born and raised both of us. Which is just crazy. It 
now it's crazy because Austin's so big. Yeah. 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 I remember on the first time that you joined us, just to give everyone a heads up if they want to go back and listen, because I think it's an important conversation. We're not going to talk about it now because you can go listen to it. But now in our culture that we're living, I mean, this was four and a half years ago. A lot has happened in our country since yeah. then. And it's, it brings up things in me that we talked about with fear, because when you were in elementary mm. school, you were in a classroom when there was right. gun violence. Your right. teacher was shot. And so we talk about that there. So I just want to throw that in to say, guys, go listen to it because I struggle with fear. And we see a lot of things in our country that make me scared. And so we had a good conversation about yeah. it. I just want to throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Susie, what are you loving these days? What am I loving? Anything? Anything. Besides like, like Friday Night Lights? I would say... Uh, did you watch, did you finish Friday Night Lights? Yes. Okay. It's so good, isn't I it? I know. I think we're going to start over. You know, see, so I don't do that. Recorded. I don't do the start oh. over. It's so fun because then you could become like an amateur director and do you talk reread about you... books? Do you reread books? I'll reread a book. I don't do that either. Oh wow. There's so many books that I, <laughs> why would I read another one again? Friday Night it was Lights. So good. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Friday Night Lights, yeah, but loving that. I'm loving um, I'm into a lot of hair products. I have I think I might have an addiction, but there's uh Dry Bar has one that I love. Uh, do you get your do you go to the dry bar? No, no. Okay. Yeah, too much time. I don't want to waste it there. I, I mean, you know. I like it. Do you? Uh-huh. Okay. I'll do. I haven't done it in a long time, but I'll go sometimes if I'm going out of town. I'll go that morning on the way to the airport. Oh, no, that makes sense. And oh, so, wow. Yeah, see? I'm oh, just going to change your life. out before I leave town. I'm like, going to change you- your life. <laughs> Two things I'm going to change your life with with traveling. Ready? Okay. So sometimes I'll go to the dry bar or blow, whatever. We have yeah. them both here. And I'll, I can work while I'm doing it. To me, it's like, oh. it's time, it's time management. Like okay. I will sit and bust out work or emails for 45 minutes. That's, and no one That's talks to me. That's actually good. That's so see? good. Yeah. And then I show up where I'm going and I don't have to wear my hair the next yes. day. All the things. Okay. That's a life change. Noted. You may give you another life change yeah, for yeah, travel. Please, please. All the travel, travel tips for me. My friend Jen and Brandon told me this a couple of years ago. A lot of times my travel is two days, you know, like in and out. Right. Yeah. And I, when you start to travel off more often, when you get home, you want to get home. I know. Like you, I don't want to wait on the bus to pick me up. Mm -mm. I don't want to wait on a bag. Like I literally want to get off the plane and be home in 25 minutes. Yeah. I valet my car a lot. Nice. I didn't know about this. I didn't, I don't think I knew about that either. It's just a little bit extra, but you know what? And I don't check bags. So I will get off my plane. Wow. I'll be in my car in roughly seven minutes. And then I'll be on my way home. And it changed my life. Well, you know what else you can do, which I did recently, which was life-changing. Will and I will go. We have a cabin, in, a family cabin in Colorado. We'll go there. And the, you come back five days later and you have no groceries. And you're like, it's like, it's, it's traumatizing to come home yeah. and not have food. Yeah. Curbside it on yes. the way home. Boom. Oh, pick it up on your way home. Yep. I got it just, you know, while you're waiting for bags, just get a little... Love app, it. get on there. That's actually been great. Love it. And if I go for a long trip, sometimes I Uber because the amount that it would cost me to pay for parking yeah. for six or seven days, oh. not valet. I don't valet yeah. for six or seven days. Uh, but if I were to park for six or seven days, I can Uber and still get in the car. I'm telling you, when I get off the airplane, I just want to get in the car. I know it's kind of bougie, huh? No. Well, you know why? Home is the reward, right? Yeah. I mean, and it's like, I didn't feel this way when I just traveled like for vacation twice a year. No, no. You want to get back to work, your people yeah. and you want to get back to your space and you want to sleep and you want to have all your comfort so around see, dry you. dry bar and valley. Okay. So you're <laughs> loving the products that you got. What else? Um, I also, um, I reread every year. Um, I don't know if you know this book, Gift to the Sea. I love it. I think it's a really actually I just got through. Re- well, you're not a rereader. But you know, when you say that right there, when you say I reread this book every year, it I, this is what comes into my head. I want to have something I say like that. <laughs> I want to have like a book that means so much to me that I visit it every year. So carry on. You're inspiring me. I need yeah. to find a book a, mm-hmm. that every January. When do you do it? That one I typically do in the summer just because she wrote it while she was on the beach. Okay. But um yeah, rereading that, that's a huge um, thing that I love doing. I also, do you ever reread your journals? Do you write journals? I don't journal. Oh, wow, wow, wow. I know. Oh. You thought I was a journaler? <laughs> yes. I feel like I need to be sometimes. <laughs> it's like, here's another thing. Listen, if we got into a counseling session, journaling is a lot of like kind of writing out your feelings. And if I don't write on then I don't have to feel them. 
<laughs> Why are we just starting to talk about this now? It's also a time thing. Like, I don't know. It feels so wasteful to just sit and, and write in a journal your feelings. You know what it does? <laughs> it, Welcome to the inside of my no, head. No, it literally <laughs> reveals your heart and who you are to in, in, in your relationship with God. So I used to when I was well, young. Well, maybe like, I don't want to see what my heart looks like sometimes. I don't know what to say because we're we're so near the end. But n- please this know you if you're listening. Last time yeah, like the when, when, <laughs> there'll be a conversation when this is not being recorded. <laughs> I've always wondered, honestly, like I just don't enjoy journaling and I never have. And all joking aside, there is a part that I'm just like, I just don't like sitting down and writing. So there's just this kind of that aspect. But if I were to be serious, not joking, I think there is a lot of it, too, that if I don't have to, if you don't write it out, then you don't have to address it or feel it. And I think I'm in touch with my feelings sometimes, but I think I avoid them a lot as well. But you know, the other upside to writing things out is I write things out. I mean, writing is almost prayer to me. I write things out and I look back three years ago and they be, they they are accomplished. Yeah. And I think there's something really powerful about that. I really do. See, I've thought about that a lot because there's a one of our kids in particular, there's some different prayers for them than anyone else. And sometimes I think I should write this so that... I can look back and kind of have these Ebenezer's and these moments of saying like, God, you did show up here. Yeah. So it's not lost on me. And I I see it for what it is. And I think I appreciate it. I just have never practiced that discipline. It's just a discipline that I've never entered into. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's not funny. I'm I'm not making a joke. Well, no, I think it's interesting too, because you're a writer. So that part, that's what was the surprising part for me. Yeah. I mean, I am a writer. Writing's not the most favorite thing I do though. I've said that a thousand times. I'm a much better verbal processor. And so I verbally process a lot with Aaron and he's not a verbal processor. So you can see how that goes. Well, who do you process when you write? If you journal though, God and yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You have, you, you have a relationship with yourself. Here we go. Susie, (laughs) this is why, can we just hold this for the retreat that we're going to do? You and I, (laughs) absolutely. You're going to be, you're going to like open up your soul care, soul care. We can be like sold out. Jamie, Ivy bought all the tickets. <laughs> what if I did that? If you're like, there's only five spots and I'm like, I'll take them all. <laughs> that would be I'm great. not bringing any friends. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm just paying for myself. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, one of the things that I love about you so much, I don't know if you remember this. I was at your house. Maybe the only time I've I've been to your house, uh, you were doing some kind of night, and we you cooked from Sean and Equus's book, Bread and Wine. Do you oh remember my this? Gosh. Wait, what? Your lake house? Where do you oh, lived on a lake? It was the, no, we didn't live in the lake. That's a family house that my okay, my yeah, father was in your house that you lived in. Yeah, yeah, she came to. It was a happy hour to celebrate her book, and I was there. That's so fun. Um, Jen was there. Jenny yeah. was there. Yeah. A lot of people I didn't know, but that was maybe my first time to even be around you in like this kind of setting where it wasn't work related, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. And one thing that struck me that night that I've always loved about you is you, you a love to gather people, but mm-hmm. you do it with a mission in mind and be really, really want to know someone and ask them questions. I do. It doesn't feel as though when I've ever been around you or even that first time, it wasn't as though you were just like, I'm so glad you're here. Have some bacon wrapped dates which those are really good and we had them that night (laughs) and they're in her book yeah um but you want to get in to know someone and i think that even when you mentioned about your book that you're that's coming out in the spring and it's about hey we get to live this life and if we just had one more year or what Mm -hmm. do you want people to say about you at your funeral (laughs) there is this sense in you that you really care about people's souls and so i want you to know that that's beautiful and it's not common and so it's beautiful that you do that well you're very dear and it's my joy to know you. It really is. I'm glad we know each other. I have too. <laughs> um, okay, Susie, thanks for joining me on the happy hour. Thank you for having me. Shopping online is so helpful for me during the holidays. The holidays are so busy that when I get to shop online, it makes everything so much easier. Thankfully, ThreadUp makes it easy to get thrift store pricing with the convenience of online shopping. Discover millions of secondhand finds from trendy brands like Everlane and Vents, all up to 90% off estimated retail. And instead of spending hours going through all those racks at the store, shop millions of deals on your phone anywhere, anytime. ThreadUp is sustainable and a more affordable way to get through this season. And for our happy hour listeners, here's a little extra holiday cheer. Get 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash Jamie. That's 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash Jamie. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with my friend Susie as much as I did. And I told you, tears come every single time. No matter your stage in life or position, there are women God has surrounding you that He is asking us to nurture, love, and disciple in the manner of living out faithfulness. Susie has a great podcast called Dear Daughters. I think you should go check it out. Also, if you aren't on our mailing list, you missed our special pre-show message with Susie's Comfort Food Bundle. Visit jamieivy.com for where to find Susie's awesome recipes, including the Thanksgiving baking that she mentioned. Today's show was edited by Chris with Podshaper, and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Show notes are written by Aki Slockers, and the whole thing is organized by Lindsay Sweeney. Next week, my guest is Elizabeth Jordan. Elizabeth is the founder and president of The Human Impact, a nonprofit ministry that serves the homeless in her city. We received an email from a woman about Elizabeth's story. Listen to what she shared with us. Her friend wrote in, Elizabeth embodies all the things your podcast hopes its listeners will be inspired by, and she has a way of offering practical advice in a humble manner. She has been creative and innovative in her work, and she is great fun to sit and laugh with. I can't tell you how many times I've read one of her blogs or something she has shared with me and just been blown away. God has been so present in her work. I really hope you will consider giving her the opportunity to join you for a podcast episode as a guest. I'm confident you will love her and the story she has to share. You guys, our email friend was right, and we cannot wait to introduce you to Elizabeth Jordan next week. Friends, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend. Have a happy hour with a friend, and I'll see you guys back here next week with my friend, Elizabeth Jordan.